All right, Chris Schaefer, what is up, my friend? We are getting ready to kick this thing off. Another little, another little uh, coffee talk uh, while we're quarantined. Coffee talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to welcome people on here, give them a few minutes to get on. We're doing something different today too. We're broadcasting on four different channels, so we're going to see how well this does. So a little test here. Uh, why not play while while you're quarantined, right? Like why not have a little have a little fun and play with some technology? You know why not? Um, but yeah, I wanted to jump on here real quick. And uh, guys, as you're coming in, let us know that you're here. Let us know that uh, that uh, you are tuning in. Maisie is letting us know that Maisie, she's tuning yeah, in. Yeah, Maisie's very excited. Yes, she just seen another dog go by, and because uh, uh, well. We're allowed to go out and walk our dogs. We're just not allowed to uh, to mingle with people. Um, so uh, yeah, Maisie. And if you guys don't know who Maisie is, Maisie is our our uh, Bernadoodle. It's, uh, actually, it's a Bernice Mountain Dog and a Doodle mix. Um, so anyway, um, yeah. So we're gonna get rocking and rolling here, Chris. I'm just gonna make sure that everything is working. Uh, but this is a little coffee talk that we're gonna have here today. But I did want to talk about. I wanted to go a little bit deeper into um, finding new opportunities in your business um, during a time like this. Um, and I do have some questions that I want to ask people joining us, but I also um, want to just open this up for some Q&A. If you guys have any questions, uh, let us know. Um, I've been on here for the past week on and off and doing these, and we get a lot of great questions. Yesterday's call was really, really good. Um, and I just kind of want to pick up the conversation kind of where we left off and, and talk about finding new opportunities in our business, not just focusing on the negative stuff that's happening, but what can we, what can we do here? What kind of questions can we ask ourselves to get, you know, good out of this type of situation? Um, cause I think we always look at the negative and then we don't look at the opportunities that could be coming our way as well. And I don't mean opportunities like taking advantage of people through a time of crisis. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying like, what does this open your eyes to and what should you be focusing on uh, moving forward? Um, so let's, uh, let's get the chat rolling here. Guys, first off, um, what I'd like you to do, and depending on when you're joining us, uh, let us know what is your coffee of choice right now or beverage of choice? What are you drinking as of right now um, I have a bulletproof coffee. Chris, do you have a, a drink of choice today or did you skip that? Mm. What is in that, by the way? Is it tea again? Tea, yeah. Bulletproof tea? If you can call it that, yeah. <laughs> Fat tea. Fat tea. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, guys, if you could do that, drop it in the comments. Let us know what you're drinking um, this morning. Um, and then that way there we can, again, make this a real like coffee talk where we're going to be able to have coffee together. Um, Chris, what did you want to discuss? What's kind of on your mind this morning? Uh, well, the biggest thing on my mind is making sure I have enough stuff, because I, I think you know, uh, we were just talking about this before we jumped on. Um, I, I'm in Colombia right now, and we're about to enter a, a, na a national quarantine, basically, mm. like real quarantine. Kind of like what's going on right now in San Francisco and New York. You can leave to go to the grocery store. You can leave to go to the pharmacy. But other than that, mm. you're pretty much inside. Unless you have a dog. You can walk your dog 20 minutes. Um, kind of at a clip. Now, what I didn't notice and uh, what I probably will take advantage of is there's no quantity limit on the times that I can walk my dog. Mm. So I'll just go out like seven times. Uh, you know, add, add those 20 minutes up and, and be one of those people. Um, as far as business stuff goes, I think the thing that um, we started to discuss this yesterday, the thing that I've been really kind of mulling over, really thinking about is, you know, everybody is stuck in the negative side of this. And you started to bring this up a minute ago where, oh, you know, I'm stuck inside. I can't do this stuff. And you, you talked about opportunities and the opportunities that we have right now. Honestly, <laughs> We always have the excuse as business owners, we always have the excuse of, I don't have time to do X. I don't have time to do Y. Mm -hmm. Well, we now have more time than we ever will have ever again, mm -hmm. right? We're not taking our kids to soccer practice. We're not, no. you know, going out to dinner for four hours on a Friday night. At least I hope not. Um, no. We're not doing any of those kinds of things. So we've got an opportunity now to either watch every show on Netflix. Right. 
or do the things that we've been putting off doing in our business because we don't have time. Mm -hmm. We no longer have the excuse of not having time, at least for the next few weeks. And so how can we take that time, leverage that time? And you and I have been talking about this for The Amazing Seller, for the brands that we're working in. How do we take this time and make the most out of it? And that's really the thing for me that I've been trying to focus on over the last few days, rather than even worrying about, you know, might I get coronavirus by going to the right. grocery store? I'm not gonna worry about it. If it happens, it happens. There's nothing I can do to prevent it. So I can either sit at home and watch Netflix for the next, for me, it's 19 days. We have a 19 day quarantine here. Okay. Or I can spend that time that I'm stuck indoors, not going crazy, and going crazy doing the stuff that I should be doing in my business. Um, and so for me, I think that's that's something that's been kind of on my mind the last few days is how do I optimize the opportunity that we have now? Because we may have this opportunity again. We may not. So how do we make the most out of what we have right now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, a bunch of things I want to jump into that's kind of like going through my mind. Um, first off, though, before we do that, uh, if you're tuning in live with us right now, uh, let me know this one thing right now so we can kind of get a better understanding of where you're at. Um, are you currently a business owner or are you starting your business or in the process of starting your business? So do you currently have a business? Yes or no, or yes, I have a business or no, I'm just starting my business. Um, this will help us just kind of see where everyone is at and we can, we can go over anything here on this call. This call is really about us being able to connect with you and be able to share with you our thoughts, our feelings, and what we're working on, what our beliefs are moving forward, even though, again, a lot of it is speculation, right? We don't know what the economy is going to do, right? We don't know what the ripple effect is going to be, but um, all we can do is control what we can control, right? So let us know in the comments right now, um, you know, are you a current business owner right now? And I don't care if it's a small business, you know, doing you know, a thousand dollars a month, or if you're doing, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a month, um, you're, you're a business owner. Um, or if you were just in the beginning stages and you want to start your business and now you're thinking to yourself, Oh my gosh, should I even start my business? You know? And I actually had a, I had a conversation with someone this morning and they were like, yeah, I was going to start this, but I'm, you know, now with this whole thing that happened, I'm just going to wait. I'm like, why wait? Like right now is the time you should be planting seeds. Like people are going to be searching for content in your market a month from now, six months from now, a year from now, but a lot of times everyone is thinking so short term that they're just thinking about right now. I shouldn't do anything right now because there's a thing going on. Yeah, there is, but let's face it. If you're teaching people how to catch more bass in a pond, they're going to need to know that three months from now, six months from now, a year from now, and from there, you're going to be able to get that traffic coming over to your website. So there's no reason to wait in my book. Um, it's, if anything, take advantage of your time. If you're sitting around, sit, sitting there thinking to yourself, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? That's time that you could be putting into action. Um, so that's my thoughts, but guys put that in the, in the comments. I want this to be interactive. Chris and I, we did one of these yesterday. Like I said, uh, Randy says, uh, eBay, no Amazon yet. Randy, I got a quick question for you. Um, how has eBay been for you as far as sales? I'm just curious. Um, so I'll throw that back at you. Um, but yeah, if you guys can drop that in the comments, let us know. But okay, so Chris, let's let's discuss this real quick. What is your what is your thoughts right now as far as like the economy? Okay, like what is this going to do with the economy for us moving forward as being someone that is looking to either start a business or looking to take their existing business. What are your thoughts for, you know, the future? And I'm saying like, cause th this probably is the new, the new now, right? Like this is probably something that we have to understand. It's not just going to go away overnight. Right. So we have to kind of like, and I don't mean just go out there and cut all your costs. I'm not saying that, but you do need to look at your business a little bit differently. And you also need to look at, okay, what has this taught me moving forward? So what do you see as far as the ripple effect of what's happening, but also what does it mean for us? I think there's a couple different things. And I sound like a, an economist prognosticator person, right? <laughs> like I feel like I'm on CNBC or like something <laughs> right now, right? Um, but the, the reality is the economy is strong. Right. Like this is not um, 
and we're we're talking specifically about the U.S. economy when when we're talking yeah. about this. Um, at least I am. There's nothing wrong economically, mm. right? Like when you look at crashes or recessions, the reason that they stick around is there's a fundamental problem in the economy, right? Look look at 2009, right? Governments told banks that they had to lend money to people regardless of their credit risk. Banks then turned around, lent that money, and then said, we're going to do all of these things to make sure that we don't lose our money. Since we have to give money, we want to make sure they did some really crazy stuff to try to make sure they weren't the ones that were at risk. Right. And that wrecked the economy, right? It took years to kind of dig ourselves out of that hole. The situation we're in right now is kind of a unicorn situation, right? Where what's causing the the Dow Jones industrial average to slide and the stock market to slide. Like if you're seeing that the, your stock numbers are down, it's not because there's an economic problem. It's because there's a fear problem. And I have a feeling, and again, this is just me prognosticating. That's you speculating, right? That uh, when this fear starts to subside, we're going to see not even just the same growth that we were seeing, but we're going to see a huge rebound. And we need to be in position for that as business owners. Um, that's more of like the numbers side of that, right? So because there's not a fundamental problem in the economy, when the fear portion goes away, it's going to go back to the same way that it was, 3 5% growth, plus a little bit extra, right? You're going to see like a rubber band effect, right? <laughs> Where like it pulled and pulled and pulled and then it snapped back versus like a long, slow climb. Um, as far as what was the other, there was a second part to that question, Scott. What does it mean? What what does it mean for us? What does it mean for oh. uh, for for businesses right now and in their future? Like, uh, should we be should we be thinking to ourselves? You know, we're gonna it's gonna be a three to a six month deal that people aren't gonna be buying as much. Like, what do you what are you kind of looking at as far as that goes? Potentially, and and you have used the word opportunity. I've used the word opportunity a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you have a great opportunity, especially if you're an established business right now. And somebody yesterday said, this is how we've always done things, quote unquote. And those are the nine, depending on how you phrase that phrase, to me, those are the nine scariest words that any business can ever tell you, right? As somebody who was a business consultant for years, you walk into a business, you say, why are you guys doing this? And they go, that's just how we've always done it, right? We've right. always had 90 employees come into an office and not talk to each other all day and just make their phone calls, which they could just as easily do from home. So if you're an established business, you have an opportunity now to realize we're in the 21st century and maybe we can save cost by not having an office. Maybe we can make some of these changes in our business to optimize so that we don't have this problem again in the future where we have to decide how do we get people to work from home? How do we get people to, to do all of these things? And that comes back into the conversation we were having yesterday about redundancy and systems. Um, if you're a new business, you have an excellent opportunity right now because most businesses are pulling back in ad dollars because they see the economy is pulling back a little bit and right. they're not paying attention to the fact that it's not a fundamental problem. It's a short term issue. Right. Um, and you have people who have the same mindset that you were just talking about, Scott, which is I'm not going to be able to sell anything for the next. Nobody's going to buy ski goggles for the next six months because the right. economy is pulling back. Right. That's not true. Fewer people may be buying ski goggles. New skiers who weren't going to buy ski goggles until next ski season, but if they if you put the right deal in front of them, they would, might not be doing that right now because they're saving their money for other things. But people who are passionate about a market are still going to buy those products. Somebody mentioned yesterday, they said uh, Amazon has what they call essentials. Does you know? And those are the things that they're allowing into yeah. their warehouses right now. Does that mean my product right now is a luxury? And mm. it's not. <laughs> right. It's just it's not a, a life saving thing for you or for a pet. Right. Um, and so nobody nobody is not buying right now. Their buying behavior may have shifted. But the people who are passionate about your thing, the thing that you're selling, are still going to continue to buy. So mm -hmm. we still have to continue to be there. And we have to use this opportunity to take the extra hour that we're not fulfilling those extra orders and turn that into time where we're creating content. Yeah. Um, I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday, Scott, um, right after we got off of our call and they said, look, we have, we have three employees that normally come into the office and they're helping us pick and pack orders. They're helping us do all of these things. Mm -hmm. Um, they now have three to four extra hours per day. What should we be having them do? Mm. They should be creating content. That's the best problem to possibly have, yeah. right? 
we can take what is normally a time issue and turn it into an absolute benefit because the, the biggest objection that you and I always get when we're like, you should be creating content, create videos, create blog posts, do all of this stuff to start to build your brand and bring in traffic when people are searching for you. People say, we don't have enough time. Now we have the time. So let's focus down on what that is, figure out how to turn that into an actual opportunity for us so that in three, six months from now, when this thing has really rebounded, and I say this thing, meaning the economic thing, yeah. not the virus thing, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. that we're in a position that we're six months ahead of everybody, if not more, because we took what is a one or two hour process and we were able to execute on that three or four times a day because we have extra time now. So that, that's kind of where I'm at with that. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, I mean, it's tough though, right? It's like, if you are in a place right now, like your job just got cut or you got laid off, like people are in a scramble and you know we've talked about this before i mean most people don't have a one month runway or even a you know a, a one week runway right like they're they're living paycheck to paycheck which that's that, terrifying to me by the way it, it is but it's reality right and so because of that people are scrambling and so you know right now there are there are opportunities even for people to leverage banks, right? Like banks are going to be loaning money, um, you know, for a lot less because of this. Um, if you have a business, you probably have uh, ways that you can cut costs. And I don't mean cut costs forever. I mean, you could probably talk to your supplier and just say, hey, is there any way during this time you can kind of let me ride for a month or two, right? So there's things that we can do um, to take care of that now, if you do work for someone and it's that we're not talking about your business specifically, um, then, you know, that is, you know, something that is hard to deal with. Hopefully you have something that you can fall back on temporarily. Um, right now, it's even hard to go out there and get a part time job, right? Because no one out there is hiring because no one's open. <laughs> no one's open. Right. So that is a that is a tough one. Right. And there's really not like a quick and easy solution for that. But while you are going, you know, going through this, it's, it's hard to focus on something that doesn't have an immediate return, but I'm telling you, if you plant seeds right now in your business or your potential business, it will, it will give you rewards later. Um, but so many people can't see that because, and, and this, I mean, forget about the crisis for a minute. People do this all the time. Anyway, they're like, oh yeah, my Amazon is running great. I've got a hero product and I'm doing a million dollars. I'm doing $2 million. You wait until the crap hits the fan before you actually go, oh, I should probably do, you know, this content thing, or I should probably build my email list, or I should probably do, you know, this external thing, but you're not because your feet aren't to the fire. So to me, the opportunity is really that your feet are to the fire now, and it's getting everyone to wake up. Um, it, can, can we predict what the, what the economy is going to do and, and how long this will happen and the ripple effect that it'll have? No, we have no idea. All we and ne do neither is does anyone else, including the professional economists. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, e exactly. Um, but what I can tell you is this, uh, you know, over the past, I'll just say 15 years, it's probably longer, um, that I've been building, uh, businesses and brands, brick and mortar and, uh, you know, just online businesses, uh, I've always, always, pretty much from the start, didn't even know what I was doing in the beginning, always built that email list. And that is like, to me, that is the one, the one thing that I believe is underutilized and also isn't looked at as a huge asset. Um, I give you an example that I, I reported on an email that we sent a couple days ago and we did like the send and then we sent to the unopens. And um, I'm looking at the numbers right here. We got 2,273 people to click, not open, click over to our website, okay? That actually added sales. It added affiliate sales. It added ad revenue. All of that came from it. I just sent another email this morning, another email, by the way, and that one there right now isn't even, I sent that at 9.23 a.m. Here it is, 11.20. So some quick math. What do you got? A couple hours, right? 632 clicks already, okay? 632 people have clicked to go over to our website and that's gonna climb. That'll probably be 1,500 by tomorrow morning and then I'll send to the reopens or the unopens and then from there, we'll get an extra five, 600 on top of that. So to me, 
Like that is something that if you are sitting on an email list right now and you're not utilizing it, you need to start communicating with that, uh, with that email list. Number two, if you're not, you need to start. Um, and that can be by building external traffic. So that way there you can get people over to an email list, but at least you have that. So we have two assets right now in all the businesses and brands that we build. And that is an email list. And that is our own traffic period. All right. So, um, that's just my little rant there on that stuff. Super, super important. And and I think it is. And, And what you're talking about there, Scott is redundancy, right? You have an extra thing where if let's just say Google goes away, right? Not going to happen, but maybe they change the algorithm and our content doesn't show up. Yeah. We still have a way, maybe it's not as effective, Mm -hmm. right? As all of the traffic that we're getting from Google, but we still have a way to at least drive some traffic and get some sales if the apocalypse happens, right? right? And we have to think about that inside of businesses. And if you have any kind of a list, you need to be thinking about that right now. If you've got an SMS text list, if you have a Facebook messenger list, you need to be able to do that. But Scott, one of the things that you and I have harped on is email lists. And I did a little bit of research for an article that I'm writing right now, and it's uh, the lowest ROI that I could find uh, being reported across industry surveys comes from HubSpot, and it's 38 to one. So for every $1 you put into email marketing, on average, marketers get $38 back. Mm. That is an insane ROI. Yeah, it is. Right? And that's not accounting for people who are using business models with mixed monetization like ads and products and affiliates and all Mm. of the stuff that we talk about doing Mm. right that's the lowest number the other numbers that i found were 65 68 70 plus to one roi Mm -hmm. it's a channel that most people don't pay any attention to and it's one of those things um, that a lot of business owners fall into the trap of i don't like when people email me Mm. so i'm not going to send emails right right you're wrong (laughs) <laughs> first of all. And second of all, think about the types of emails you don't like getting. You don't like getting the Best Buy Sunday catalog. You don't like getting those things. Guess what? Those emails don't work anyway, and they're way harder to do. If you're sending content, you're being friendly, and you're providing value, nobody gets bothered by that, right. and it's super effective. And so we need to take ourselves out, and it's a, it's a mistake we make a lot as business owners. I don't like X, so I'm not going to do X. Yeah. Maybe we need to pay attention to that. I don't read blogs, so I'm not going to write blogs. I don't watch YouTube videos, so I'm not going to make YouTube videos. That's fine, but there's hundreds of millions of people who do Mm. inside of our audience in any given niche. And so we need to figure out where our audience is and go there versus saying, I want to be here, regardless of the channel. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Totally get it. And uh, I just, again, I mean, it's it's hard, right? It's It's a tough time. It's hard to think to yourself on how do I... How do I work on something right now when, you know, this over here is happening and this bad thing is happening? Um, and, it, and I'm not saying it's easy at all, um, but I am saying that it's pretty darn important to look at the opportunities that, like, let this be a time that you ask the question, what can I do in the fu- for the future? You know, what can I do now that will allow me to be more secure in the future, right? What is, like, what right, right now you need to reverse you know, engineer or kind of reverse the question as far as like, what's the one question you can ask yourself? Like, and it's not just about, oh, how do I make more money? Like, that's just such a generic question. Like, what is the thing that you know, if you put into practice, could either help your business right now thrive through this time that's that we're about to, you know, like get into because it's happening, right? Like right now and things are being shut down. I mean, I think about the local businesses, like the grocery stores are still cranking, right? Cause they're delivering items or you can go there and they'll bring it out to your car. Like they're still, they're cranking, right? Restaurants aren't right. You might have takeout, but if you don't offer takeout, your business is done, right? Your business is done for three weeks, four weeks, who knows, right? And that's scary. Uh, for people that have employees, those employees, what's going to happen to those employees. They're not going to have a place to go to work. Right? So then they're out. Right. So it just does have that ripple effect. But what can we do right now? Like right now. To, and, and again, those questions are so very important. When we ask questions, we have to automatically start to think about the solution. Right. And so that's kind of what I always do, even though at times it's hard. Right. Because we have to break it down into smaller chunks. Um, so, OK, so let me um, let me do this now real quick. Um, let me ask. For anyone that is here live, if you guys can participate, um, 
I'm noticing people aren't really participating today here, so I'm I'm gonna have to uh, I'm gonna have to call some people out here. They haven't uh, had enough coffee yet. I think that's I guess the... we might not have enough coffee or tea or whatever your drink is. Um, so do me a favor and let me know. Do you currently have, and this can be a yes or a no, do you currently have an email list that you're either building or that you've already uh, built for your business? So just answer that in the comments. I'm just curious to see uh, who actually does have one currently. Um, so uh, right now, uh, again, I want to I want to dig a little bit deeper into the opportunities. So, Chris, let's let's kind of go through this. So, for us right now, let's say, and let, let's just take like one of the brands that we're building a content site. Let's just say that. What opportunities do we have right now, um, top of mind? Like, what do we have right now that you believe? Okay, um, we've got an opportunity here. The biggest thing for us right now is the content creation portion. And it's the same conversation that you and I had or that I that I was talking about that I had uh, with somebody yesterday, which is we now have more time, mm-hmm. right? I, I'm not going out to dinner on Friday night. Right. What can I do with that hour? I can either watch two more episodes of Brooklyn Nine-Nine on Netflix or um, I can create – a great piece of content that's going to bring us traffic forever. And we're already doing that. But how do we take this time and and double, triple down on that so that we can be ahead of where we would be otherwise? Does that make sense? Like, we're not saying you're going to create a piece of content right now and it's magically going to transform your business because we know it takes three to six months for that to really start to work in your business. But if I'm able to go from one piece of good content a week to three pieces of good content a week right now, that means I'm three times further along. Right in three to six months from now than I am if I just continue to create that one piece of content per week. I think that's, that's a big one for us. Although in, in either of those brands, we're not creating a ton of that content. A lot of that is being outsourced. Um, although I did see a great piece of content that needs to go on one of those channels yesterday oh, yeah. in one of my social media feeds. And I think you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, there's that. And I think the email list in both of those brands is a big opportunity for us to to double down and focus on right now. You know, we have a big email list in one of those brands. We built an email list a while ago in one of those brands and haven't done a ton with it. Um, and we don't really have a w- an easy way for people to get on those lists consistently right now. Right. Um, and that would be a big thing for us. Owen. Uh, <laughs> Owen is headbutting my uh, my little laptop nice. here. Um <laughs> And then the the third thing would be figuring out what we want to do from a monetization standpoint. It's still a little early to start to do that. But with the extra time that we have right now, it does not hurt us to start having that conversation in either of those brands and saying, ah, maybe we put something here. And, and we actually started to have that conversation via Voxer uh, Friday, which is like, oh, maybe we put something in the sidebar here. Maybe we do this. Maybe we do that. Um, to start to see the fruits of our labor now that we are five months in. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. Six months yeah. in, I guess. Um, and you know, we are starting to see that day over day, week over week, month over month traffic hockey stick, um, that we expected to see right about now. And so how do we take advantage of that and really push that further faster, um, is the, the conversation that we need to be having. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I, uh, I'm excited. I I looked at the numbers this morning just to see where we're at for traffic wise. And, uh, I mean, both of these content sites are trending up. Like we are, uh, you know, I'm, I'm at this point, I'm very optimistic that we're going to double our numbers again this month. Um, the one cool thing that we've added inside of, and we're, and we're sharing this inside of Brand Creators Academy uh, and, and really like all of the ins and the outs and stuff. But I love to just give the high level overview here just so you guys can kind of have some takeaways. Um, and again, that's why it doesn't happen overnight. Um, But we added um, some Pinterest stuff to both brands. And um, we're starting to see in the one brand some really, really good growth. Um, I mean, to the point of, you know, a thousand people coming over from Pinterest within like a month and a half of building out this extra piece of um, real estate that drives over to, you know, our platform. So again, it's something that we didn't see anything the first, you know, three, four weeks, right? And then all of a sudden it's starting to take off. Uh, and so that's really exciting to be able to see that stuff, but it starts by doing, right? We can sit here and we can say, oh, we can do this, we can do that, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. But until you actually do it, you're not gonna get any results. 
Um, and it just, it does take time, but why not start planting the seeds now? And so I'm excited about just continuing to, to really grow those brands content wise. And then from there starting to monetize. And today I actually, Chris, I sent you over a link, um, talking about an, another ad platform, um, that we might be able to start using and testing as long as it doesn't slow the site down because we're going to approach 10,000 page views and um, it doesn't require that, but in my head, I thought I'm not going to really run ads until we get to about 10,000. I don't, I don't want to slow the site down at all. I want to, you know, show Google that it's a, a site that's just delivering information and content. And then I'm going to start to, to add those in, but it'd be interesting to see what 10,000 page views could yield, whether it's a hundred bucks a month, a couple hundred bucks a month, who knows? Um, but it's, it would be nice to see that start turning into some revenue. Yeah. And if it's the platform that I'm thinking of, I hadn't seen the link yet, but if it's the platform I'm thinking of, you're talking about half of what you would get from the other platforms in terms of CPMs, mm -hmm. which is cost per meal, right? The mm -hmm. amount they pay us for every thousand people. Um, but it doesn't hurt to test, mm -hmm. right? If we put it on, we don't like it. We Just can take do it down. It. Yeah. Um, but if you're talking, you know, it would probably be like 40, 50 bucks a month in 10,000 page views, which doesn't sound like a lot and it's not, but that pays for an additional piece of content every month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Or two. Well, and, um, and the, and the site is growing like that's 10,000 right. this month. The following month could be 20. Right. Well, like, that's, that's the other thing that's kind of interesting, Scott. And I don't know, you posted some screenshots inside of brand creators Academy yeah. this morning, but you didn't post the month over month growth. Mm. Um, and so we're up 42% overall mm -hmm. 30 days versus the 30 days previously. Yeah. Um, now the trick with that is it looks like we had a huge drop in traffic at the beginning, but that's because it was the end of when we were running the contest. Right. So we're actually up well more than 42%. Right. Search traffic, organic search traffic is up 190%, mm. 30 days versus 30 days. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And week over week, we're actually up 50%. So this week versus last week, we're up 50% overall in traffic. Mm. Right. And we're seeing that continue to grow and it will continue to grow as stuff continues to get indexed and yep. it gets shared more on social media and all of those kinds of things. Um, and then in the other brand, I haven't looked yet this morning. I, ha I didn't look at the comparisons, but it's, it's fairly similar because they were started with the same process yep. around the same time. Yep. Um, but yeah, you know, even if it's only 40, 50 bucks a month that we're bringing in, um, for most people that would cover their entire cost of the business, right? Mm -hmm. We're outsourcing a lot of this content because we have a lot of other things that we're doing. But if you're the, if you're the person creating the content for your brand, Troy, um, then, <laughs> then it's going to cover your hosting. It's going to cover all of those things and potentially let you outsource a piece of content that you wouldn't have been able to create otherwise, right? Yep. For 30, 40 bucks. Yeah, so yeah. as long as you can do it in a non sleazy way, there's no reason not to test it. And if you don't like it, you can always take it off, yeah. right? Test it for a month or two, see if it's something that you like. And if you don't, then take it off. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love it. And, uh, that's the thing, right? Like when, once you get traffic, you can start to test those, test those things. And, um, I mean, again, we, we believe in this model so much, we're actually going to be starting a third brand. Uh, and uh, it'll be another content brand, similar idea, doing it probably a little, a slight little tweak in it. Um, um, not too much, but things that we've learned, again, from doing this now versus even two years ago to now, like being a little bit more strategic, being a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, creating, you know, a strategy for the content versus just blanketing, you know, the whole market with just all of the content that we think would make it a good content. We call them content trees, content clusters, whatever you want to call them. But from there, it's where you're building out content that's related to each other that could be interlinked and all of that good stuff. Um, but there, there's a post that we just did, Chris, and I, I'll share this with you. Uh, I'll share it in the group, in the, uh, in the academy too, but just to let people know, we actually created a post uh, about three weeks ago. And that one there right now gets about 1600 searches a month on just Google. And um, we are ranking on page one already in position number five or six. All right. And the reason is, is because now our site is starting to get a little bit of trust with Google, a little bit of authority with Google. We have other articles that are letting Google know that our site is about this topic, right? So all of that stuff starts to compound on itself. Um, so again, uh, you know, we're just scratching the surface with what we've already got indexed. 
Um, and we've got a whole bunch of other keywords that are already sitting there. They're indexed, but they're just not on page one yet. Give it another three months, six months. That's why you start to see that go up because it gets indexed. And then all of a sudden you start getting some of this traffic from these long tails. And that's what we're, that's what we're doing. And that's what we're focused on. But whenever we start a brand, we're never thinking in the first six months, we're going to see any type of results. Really. It's just a matter of building it out. Now, do we want to check the analytics in a month and see? Yeah, sure we do. Right. But we can't get hung up on that. We can't be like, oh, this doesn't work. You know, we, we posted six articles and we don't have any traffic. You know, um, you, you can't. Well, it's do the that. same thing. It's the same thing in any business model. Um, yeah. The the difference here is we're talking about redundancy, right? Yeah. So this is a way for us to have a redundant way that we can monetize the business. Mm -hmm. If our physical products go away, let's just talk about the the new brand, right? Which as of this week is three years old. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if our physical products in that brand went away which we can't send into Amazon right now, I don't think. Mm -hmm. We can't do any of it. So if, if that revenue stream went completely away, we still have content that we can monetize on. We still have digital products in that brand that we can monetize on. Mm -hmm. We still have affiliate links to all kinds of stuff in that, pro in that brand that we can monetize on. Mm -hmm. And no matter what you're doing, you know, let's just take the Amazon business model, quote unquote, right? Mm -hmm. You're looking at probably eight months to a year before you start pulling profit out of that from the day that you start, right? It takes 30 to 60 days to find a product. Then it takes another two to three months for you to get that product into Amazon warehouses and launch yep. it. In the meantime, you've shelled out five grand, right? Before you start to see any money back. Three to $5,000 is typically what we say people should start with there. And that's before you start to see any money back. But then you can't, as soon as you start selling product, you can't just take money back out of that business. No. Right? No. You're going to need more inventory. So you need to right. set that money aside. And in that brand that we were just talking about, the new brand, the three-year-old brand, our toddler brand, mm -hmm. um, right? Is it's not, still it's not in the toddler market. <laughs> is the is the three-year-old is a three-year-old still considered a toddler? I think Discuss. so. Yes, uh, I'm for clumped. Uh, <laughs> that brand, we didn't take anything out of that brand for I think 11 months, and then we yeah. took a little bit because we we said, okay, if we have enough to reorder all of our products in the bank, then we feel comfortable enough taking like a grand each out yep. right? is kind of right. what we did there. Right. And then we immediately regretted it because we ran out of stock in Q4. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's just one of those things. It's the same thing. Like if you're starting with the content approach, that to me is a much safer approach to start with. Yeah. Uh, whether or not you're going to monetize with ads, whether or not you're going to monetize with digital products, affiliate products, physical products, which you can and should do all of those yep. when you are ready. When you're ready. Um, but that to me is a safer way to start than starting with the physical product because we're not reliant on things. And we have the redundancy of having the traffic where if Amazon doesn't allow us to ship in product, we can just say, hey, guys, look at this, right? right. Go over here. Look at this digital guide that we have on, on bass fishing. Look at the, you know, the, the new article that we put out on bass fishing. And we can make $30, $50, 80 $100 just from ad revenue or from whatever. Um, that to me is a much safer approach. And honestly, in six months, Scott, We've spent about the same amount of money. We've spent around three thousand mm -hmm. dollars, um, maybe closer to thirty five hundred, four thousand, if you include the contest that we right. did to build the email list. Right, right. Um, so we're still well within that three to five thousand dollar mark that you would need, and we're actually ahead of where we would be mm -hmm. if we had just started with physical products. Does that make sense? Like we've spent less money than we would have had to to start a physical products business. Mm -hmm. We still can. But we're able to do that without risking any of our own money because as we start to monetize the things right. that we've already done, right. then we're done. The other thing is that three to five thousand dollars is a fixed cost, right? Yeah. So we've spent that money, but it's now bringing us in traffic which we can monetize forever, right? Absolutely. Unlike three to five thousand dollars in a physical products business, where that money is out literally until you sell the business, right? You always need to have inventory. So you're always rolling that money forward to some extent in the business until the day that you sell it. When we pay ourselves back for that $3,500, $4,000 that we've spent, we're done. Mm -hmm. we're, we're at break even at that point. Mm -hmm. Anything from there on is pure profit, right? And then that three to $5,000 that we save up to start a physical product in that brand, if that's what we decide mm -hmm. to do, that's a, that's a fixed cost for us, right? Yeah. It's not coming out of our own pocket. We're still bringing in revenue. And we're able to test something. And if it fails, we don't have to keep trying to roll it forward. We just say it was an expense. Right. Here's the thing too, to look at. I was just doing some, I was doing some uh, calculator work here. Um, but here's the other thing too. Like, let's say for example, you build out the site and you spend five grand. 
build it out. You, you spend five grand to build out the site, and let's say it takes you a year to do it. I can almost guarantee that at that point, if, and this is a big word here, if, right? If you get that to start generating um, income, which I believe after a year, let's say a year and a half even, you can get that to a thousand to three thousand dollars if you are strategic as far as the kind of posts that you're creating. If it's uh, you know if it's product based posts or if you have enough traffic to where you can start turning on Ad Thrive Network and stuff like that. But let's just say that we can get it to three thousand dollars. Just however we do it, right? It could be selling t-shirts. It could be selling uh, print-on-demand stuff. It could be um, affiliate stuff. It could be ad thrive stuff. It could be a mix of everything. But let's say that we can get it to $3,000 a month. Right now, the multiple on that, because you're you're generating you know, per year, obviously, over 30 grand, you're talking $108,000 if you just did a 3X multiple, right? So that means you would have invested $5,000 on getting content created, and then from there, putting it up for sale. And these sites here at that price point are flying off the shelf, flying, okay? Because people don't wanna do the whole building a business phase. They wanna get it to where it's making $3,000 a month. But the cool thing is, is by us building out these properties, and that's kind of what we're doing here behind the scenes, is we're building these these pieces of property. It's like, I look at us as like a general contractor that finds the land and then we go build a house and we either rent it out, or hold it, or we sell it. Right? So to me, spend five grand, wait a year, wait two years and make 95 grand. Like that's a pretty good investment. Um, so again, it's not always immediate, but that's also something that you can do, or you build this thing out. Like, so what we're, what we're doing right now is I've got two of these things being built. We're, we're documenting this process and we're building these things out. The idea is to get them, in, you know, over a year old, getting, get, getting them to a thousand dollars net per month. Okay. Thousand dollars per month net. That means I just bought a piece of real estate and I'm making a thousand dollars net. Where can you do that, Chris? Where can you buy a piece of real estate and make a thousand dollars net, and, uh, and 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 do that within even two years? Where can you so do the, that? So here's the other portion of that: you spent five thousand dollars to buy a piece of real estate that's netting you a thousand dollars. Right, not a hundred and fifty, right? two hundred thousand dollars in a right. loan. You can you can buy a lot of real estate that will net you a thousand dollars a month. But I mean, think think about your lake house, right? If you're buying properties like that, yep, they will make you a thousand dollars a month. But they're a couple hundred thousand dollars in investment up front. Now, yes, you're leveraging, you can leverage debt to do that. You can do those things, or you can pay three to five thousand dollars, or even less. And here's the thing if you're the one creating your content, yeah. the reason it's costing us so right. much to do this is right. we have a bunch of projects going on. Right. 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 Um, and actually, I have an idea that we need to talk about after we get off. Um, it relates to the third site. But I'm curious okay. if we have more direct control over some of the writers, what the mm. quality of content versus the cost is. Mm -hmm. um, but just a, a little interesting side note. We're yeah. paying to have all of that content written, right? If you think about The Amazing Seller, you're creating content, I'm creating content. It doesn't cost us anything. Right. If you're the person creating content in your brand, it's going to cost you the cost of hosting and the cost of a domain. Scott, what is the cost of hosting for a year? Oh, for a year? On HostGator. Uh, it's know. probably... I mean, for for a shared a shared hosting account, you get the uh, they call it the hatchling or something like that on yeah. HostGator, and you can host up to like five different sites. It's like eight ninety five a month, so call it a hundred hundred bucks, hundred twenty bucks a, a year. I'm gonna find out right now. I'm actually gonna build it, and we'll find out. But you, let's say, your, you, go ahead. And, and your domain name is gonna be like ten bucks for the year. So you, you don't even months. need to buy a theme for WordPress. It's got 12 months is $3.95 a month, which means it's a little under $48. There you go, 50 bucks. Um, and that would be if you bought the year, mm -hmm. right? And then let's just assume you're not getting a free domain from HostGator or from somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. uh, $12.95. Mm -hmm. So you're talking $61 plus time mm -hmm. to create something that can create you. And let's not even say $1,000 a month. That's our goal for these brands. Mm -hmm. But if it were able to bring you that 40 or $50 a month after right. a year, right? Which it's is going to come in itself. essentially in perpetuity. It right. doesn't sound like a lot, right? But $50 a month 
that's over $500 a year, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's $600 a year if you do the math, right? That's going to come in basically in perpetuity, even if you don't continue to add to it. And here's the thing. When you're building a brand, it is a flywheel. Right? When you're creating content, when you're adding emails to your email list, when you're doing the real business stuff, mm -hmm. you're going to continue to see exponential growth in that, at least into a point. Right, mm -hmm. You might get, get it to a couple thousand dollars a month with ads, let's just say. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we have to go from 200,000 monthly unique visitors to 400,000 to really see a difference. Yeah. Right. Okay maybe there's a different way that we can monetize. Then we can add in physical products. That's when we have to think about monetizing differently to continue to see that exponential right. growth. Right. But we can then pull different levers to do that, right? And so with what you and I are doing, you're talking about investing 5,000-ish dollars and that's that's outsourcing all of the content creation. Right. Right? To get something that returns you $1,000 a month. Who would not, in their right mind, put up $1,000 or $5,000 right now, if I told you, and I, this is not a promise. No, right? please. But if you were to give me $5,000 right now, I would give you $1,000 a month. Yeah. Let's just say it stops at the end of next year. Yeah. Right? Would you not want $12,000? Let's just mm. say it's 12 calendar months and then mm. everything goes away. Google disappears off the face of the planet because there's right. coronavirus 2.0 and right. no one can use the internet and we're back in the Stone Age starting December 31st, 2021. You've still made $12,000 for your $5,000. Right. Who wouldn't in their right mind want to do that? Right. And I think everybody would, unless you have some sort of massively pressing thing where you can't spend that $5,000. And it's not $5,000 right now. No. It's $5,000 over the course of that year. Yeah. But even if you do have that thing, all of you have $61, I yeah. think is the math, right. $62, right. Um, over the course of the next year that we can spend, right? Cancel Netflix for two months you're there, <laughs> right? Like, there, it's very easy to do. Don't and, drink a coffee at Starbucks for right. two weeks, right? and you're there I for mean, the year. I mean, the, the whole thing is, though, is, you know, people need to realize, you know, it takes it takes the time, right? It's like when you, if you it's went time, right now. time or money, right? Time or money. Are the, but, I mean, if, if, you're thinking, if you're thinking to yourself, like, you know what? I would love to get a piece of real estate because real estate, you know, everyone always needs it. It's always going to be there. So the whole long-term strategy with like real estate, and I'm not talking like lake house, Airbnb stuff, like Airbnb is going to take a hit right now. I have an Airbnb. We haven't seen it. We're in, we're in more of the luxury Airbnb market. So I'm not sure how that will affect us. Well, and but, you're in, you're in a longer term, like vacation rentals yes, style too, yes. versus like a the one, other one, two Z night. Yeah, if people are traveling and they want an Airbnb, that's different. Mine is more for like people, they just want to get away and be on the lake or whatever, right? Um, and a lot of these people have a lot of money because they're booking, you know, to stay in the in the house for seven days or anywhere from depending on the the season, the time of the season, anywhere between forty eight hundred dollars and seventy five hundred dollars a week, right? But the house also, it's uh, it's a it's a large investment, right? Let's just say that. Um, so if you are, and I I know people that are doing this, if you're just looking at buying a piece of real estate um, for let's say three hundred grand. And then you're going to be able to charge enough to cover your mortgage. You know, you have to put maybe 80 grand down or whatever, right? Whatever it is. And then you have to hope that you can have a net at the end of the month that you can put into a little slush fund that just in case something happens, you can replace stuff, right? And then you have a management team and all that stuff. So if you can come out with 300 bucks a month, you'd be happy. Right. And you have this, this mortgage out there. You're hoping that you can hold it for at least 10 years. So it gets, you know, it, it appreciates and all of that stuff. Right. What I'm talking about is the, the online real estate is you building a piece of real estate that will, it will gain, uh, you know, traction. And then as it builds traction, it gets more traffic. The, the, uh, the revenue starts to go up. And then from there, your three X, four X multiple is now going to be multiplying, right? So that's the way that I'm thinking about this whole thing. And so myself and Chris included are looking at these as pieces of real estate that we're building. And we it might take us a year to build this house, but then when we sell it, we're gonna cash out or we're gonna hold it and then let it mature a little bit while the, you know, while the market gets, you know, gets better or it appreciates, or in our case, until we find the right buyer. So, Scott, you built your house in New York, right? Yes. 
How many hours would you say you put into that? Oh gosh. Well, see now that I wasn't GCing it either. So I was doing all that work myself for the most part. I had some stuff outsourced, but for the most part, um, you know, I did all the work. I mean, hundreds of hours. Right. And, and so that, that's, that's the thing that I'm trying to, so a week, how many times, how, how long were you there every week? Do you think? Oh gosh. Well, I would work my six, my 60 hours a week and I'd probably go there at night for four or five hours. Every night or Monday to Friday? Every night. So 28 and, hours. Well, a the week. weekends were longer. I would go the weekends. I would work eight hours. Okay. So, so let's call it 36 hours a week. How yep. did it take you a year? It took me, tw- uh, it took me 11 months. So just under a year. Okay. So 36, is that what we said? Yep. Times 48. Yep. Cause that would be 48 weeks. Yep. Right. 1,728 hours. There you go. Right. If you're comfortable, do you know how much that house was worth the day that you moved into it? Yeah. The day I moved into it was probably at that time, probably around 200. And that includes the land and everything else, right? Yeah. Well, like the land was, well, the land, okay, let's, let's add the land in there. Probably another 50 grand because, because the land, the land was given to us. $250,000. Yep. Right. So you put in what, what was the number? 1700 hours. Let's just call it. Yep. To make $250,000. Well, but again, I but borrowed. But you didn't make that. Right. No, I so, borrowed probably about 100000 to build that. So I had instant equity in it. But that equity was sweat equity. It was my 1700 hours. So if you're able to create a piece of content, let's just say every two hours. Yep. Right? How much content would that be? 48. Be so we said 1700 I'm not doing the math on the fly here, guys, if one of you guys has it. <laughs> uh be 850 pieces of content, Yeah. right? Chances are you can create content a little bit faster than that, yeah. right? And, and I'm just doing this math based on how much, how long it took you, right, yeah. to build that house. Yep. So if you were able to create 850 targeted pieces of content in your market, mm. you would be able to bring in, and, and our goal is somewhere between 500 and 1,000 monthly uniques mm-hmm. for each piece of content that we yep. create, right? That's, that's kind of the ideal. So 850, let's use the bottom end number there. 850 times... 500, that would be 425,000 monthly uniques if you're actually able to achieve that. Now, some of them are going to be higher, some of them are going to be lower, yeah. but if we just use the bottom line average, yeah. right? So let's just use 425, I did that math right, right? 1,700, 8, 850 times 500. Yeah, I didn't miss a comma there. So that's 425,000. And let's use that four dollar number. Okay. <laughs> um, so it'd be four hundred twenty-five times four, right? You're bringing in seventeen hundred dollars a month just from ads mm-hmm. on the lowest end. That's the like, lowest conceivable, end. right? Right. If you're on something like MediaVine or AdThrive, you're bringing in probably closer to twelve to fourteen, which would be about six thousand dollars a month. Yeah, and that's probably about accurate because right now on our new brand, the one that's three old old now we're getting and i actually look at that number but we are um even even with this whole crisis the numbers have dropped a little but not terribly um we're we're getting about 150,000 uniques a month maybe 175 depending and um we're averaging between four and five thousand dollars a month right and now we're getting a higher CPM than a lot of markets in that market, but even if we assume a low end number, yep. which we're doing here, you're talking six thousand dollars a month, which would be seventy two grand a year. Yep. Right. Which means that business would be worth if you're selling it based on how niche sites are sold, right? If we're not doing any physical products, any of those kinds of things, it would be worth about one hundred and forty thousand dollars if you were to sell it today. Mm-hmm. Right. But here's the thing, that number continues to go up, right? So if our traffic flatlined there, the only monetization that we were doing is ads and you know, we were limited to $6,000 a month, which that's a very low end number that doesn't include affiliates, that doesn't include. And if you are at 425,000 monthly uniques and you're not doing other things, you're wrong and I will gladly buy your business. Um, But every month that we do that, we're appreciating value. There is no possible way your house Unless you live in San Francisco, maybe it's possible uh, that your house is appreciating in value seven thousand dollars every month, right? right? Because you had a fixed investment, mm-hmm. right? And you're doing that. But here's the thing: 
you didn't pay any money to do this necessarily. Right. If you, I'm just using your time for labor, right? right? So you right. didn't put in the hundred thousand dollars up front that you had to pay no. back. You didn't do any of those kinds of things, no. and you still come out with the same amount of work, quote unquote. You still come out if you just look at the numbers on paper and assume that you're going to sell it the second that you can. Mm -hmm. You come out with the same amount of money with none of the overhead, right? And if you hang on to it for a little bit, mm. you're adding seven thousand dollars a month in value to that asset. Right? Well, the cool time. The cool thing that that we're doing is like, and, and I said to you this when I had this whole idea of like building these online pieces of real estate was like, I don't want to do the writing myself. I don't have the time, and I just I'm not a and good you writer. Hate it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. So don't want to do it. So my whole idea was, being from the construction world years ago, I didn't need to know how to build the house, even though I did. Once I understood how to build it, then I could offload and then build teams to help me uh, really, you know, put everything together. So the whole thing here for us has been like figuring out, okay, number one, I enjoy doing the niche research. I enjoy finding these niches. So I love doing that. I'm going to do that for the rest of my life. I just love it. Right. I, and, and I can see opportunities when someone get, you know, I'm like, wow, I didn't realize that was a niche. And then all of a sudden I start exploring it. Right. So that's exciting to me. That's fun. It's kind of like finding the land and then you're like, okay, cool. Now let's build a house. I don't want to do the, the foundation work. I don't want to do, you know, putting up the walls and doing the sheetrock and doing all that stuff. I'm going to hire people to do that, but I got to find good people. Once I find good people, I move them on to the next project and then I move them on to the next project. And that's what we do. So that's what we're doing. And we're still, we're actually still refining all of that, right? Um, we're, we're building processes and systems. And once we do that, now we have a team that we can just go, okay, we want to build one over there. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here in a month. We're going to break ground and then boom, you go. And we actually have one that we're going to be starting here fairly soon. Chris, you, you know exactly what that one is. Um, and it's going to follow the same exact process, except we're going to tweak it a little bit because we learned from the last two one, you know, the last two that we just did. Right. And it's not big things, just subtle things. Right. It's like, oh, next time we do footings, let's do it this way, because last time we learned that we didn't need to do it that way. And we wasted a little bit of time. Right. So that, that's all we're doing. Um, so anyway, hopefully this was helpful, guys, just kind of talking through it, because that's kind of I, I think understanding the opportunities that are out there right now, like. It, they're out there. Like they're not going away because of the economy. People are still going to be on Google, still going to be searching. People are always in need of content. And if you currently have a physical product business, you should be bolting this onto your business. Like you should be bolting this on. Um, so, okay. We had a, a few questions here. Um, how do you pronounce, is it? Uh, Leonid. Leonid. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, I have a business on Amazon two months at the moment. Sales are constantly uh, decreasing. I don't have an email list. I know it's a big problem. The next step is to build an email list. Yes, it is. But I would say even alongside that, it's also about creating that content that we just talking about, you know, and right now would be a great question to ask yourself, just, you know, you or anyone watching is your business. Like, let's say that you are selling on Amazon. Is your business a product only? Or is it a business that really is, you know, serving a market, right? If you sell a fishing pole, that's fine, but your fishing pole is being used by people in the market that also need questions answered. They need how to's, they need product reviews, they need comparisons, they need entertainment, they need all of these things. So if you're selling a product right now, I want you to ask this one question. Are you only selling a product or are you delivering value to your market through resources? And that's a big question, but the email list will allow you to connect with those people. But if you have content, then you can send them over to content that you're producing. Now, if you don't have content, that doesn't mean that you can't build that email list and direct them to, to uh, different content pieces. And again, we just recently did this in the brand that we're talking about, uh, the, uh, one of the case studies that we're doing. We uh, actually, this morning, I just did it again, Chris. I sent another email to that list and I basically just said, Hey, um, you know, I know right now it's, it's, uh, you know, we're having a tough time here in, uh, you know, in the world and hopefully you're all safe and sound. Um, but I figured I'd send you this, this quick little funny, uh, video because who doesn't want to laugh, you know, when times are, are tough. And then I just gave a link to a Facebook post that we posted on our page that we shared. And then we just said, Hey, 
Do you have a funny story? Share it. And that was it. And, and all we're doing there is we're trying to show up to the marketplace. Like we are in this market. We are serving this market. We are with you. We are like you. Um, let's, let's talk kind of like what we're doing here right now. Same exact thing. So, um, I would definitely say, um, that's important. MT, uh, can someone tell me if you want to register your brand on Amazon, how much does it cost? It doesn't cost anything to register. You just do need the trademark. The trademark is what will cost you. Now, trademarks can be a hundred bucks. They can be a thousand bucks. Uh, it just depends on where you get it, who you hire and all of that stuff. Um, so, uh, that's the answer to that. It doesn't cost you anything on Amazon. They just, they need, uh, that stuff before they'll, they'll grant yep. you the, uh, you know, brand the Amazon yep. trademark or the Amazon, you know, brand registry is really what you're, what you're doing. Um, I fly right. What's up? Hi guys. Been adding content for over a year, not monetized yet, but it will happen. Um, you both are great mentors. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. And, uh, you got a question, Chris? Because I had one too. Yeah, I, I know they're a baller, and uh, yeah. one of the uh, one of the questions that I have for you is, what have you seen? Like, are you looking in Google Analytics? What is the the difference between now and a year ago in terms of what's coming to your site? Mm. Um, I, I'd be curious to hear that. Yeah. Um, because typically you should be seeing a a large growth in that at this point if if you're creating the right kinds of content. Well, and and he, here's the big one, right? If you're consistent, right? Like, okay, so been adding content for over a year. Does that mean one a month? Does that mean one every two months? Does that mean one every week? Does that mean one every, you know, three days? Like that's important guys. Like to me, it's, it's all about consistency and really showing that you are putting content out on a regular basis. I would prefer it to be, it would really be, um, even scheduled, like where you're doing it Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or you're doing it every Friday or you're doing it every Monday. Um, Hassan says, is it a good time to buy a house now? <laughs> it depends. It depends. Uh, last week, mortgage rates were the lowest I think I've ever seen them. Um, so if you have a good deal, there's no reason not to buy it. Here's the thing. When the economy is great, there's good deals. When the economy is terrible, there's good deals. It's yep. just a matter of where you are and if you're if you're at the right point to take advantage of it. Yeah. Um, so take a look in your market and see. Yeah. Another good question here from Chris. Would adding a blog to my e-commerce website be a good move? I use yes. WordPress. Would you add it as a subdomain? <laughs> so the first question, would adding a blog to your e-commerce? The answer is yes, but going back to what I had said, does your e-commerce serve the market or are you just talking about your product, right? And so the answer is absolutely, Chris. You, you could do that and you should do that. And if you're not serving a market, you need to figure out the angle that your product plays in a market. Um, like I used the example before, if you are selling headphones, you might not want to just sell headphones to everyone. You might want to niche down and sell headphones to people that are podcasting or people that are runners or people, you know what I mean? Like you want to find that market and then start there and then from there build out the content around that market or that sub market. Um, so anyway, the answer is yes, 100%. Now, the other part of that is using WordPress and adding a subdomain. Chris, can you speak to that? You don't need to. If you're on WordPress, it's a blog platform. So it just be the only, the only time it would that would make sense is if you're selling on Shopify or something like that. And if you, you have a different do... platform that doesn't have a good blogging yeah. component, then yes, WordPress started as a blogging platform, and they offer WooCommerce, which is an e-commerce extension of that. So literally, Chris, all you would have to do is go into your website backend, click on the Posts tab, and put in a post, and it will show up. Um, you may want to play around with your homepage and some of those kinds of things and maybe change your theme so that it's more of a content focus and less of an e-commerce focus. Um, but you're good to go. You don't have to change anything to add a blog. Um, I fly right. I offer travel tips on airline uh, as an airline agent and have an affiliate uh, recommendation. So far, not getting much traffic. What can I do? Well, right now is going to be a tough time for that business, obviously, because of what you know we're dealing with right now. But with that being said... I still would not let off the gas because this we are going to come out of this. There are people going to be looking for travel tips. They're going to be looking for, uh, you know, like if you're talking about, uh, you know, um, recommendations or tips uh, or any of that stuff, I would not back off of that. And you did reply once a week on YouTube. Okay, that's fine. 
So my my thing there would be on that, are you only posting on YouTube or are you taking that YouTube video, embedding it into a blog post and then writing content that, that supports that or even taking transcripts from that and then putting that up on a blog because then you'll have two pieces of content, two pieces of real estate from that one piece of content. So that would be my other question. The other, the other thing, and this is the thing that people miss with content a lot of times mm -hmm. is how are we coming up with the ideas? Yeah. For this content. Are yeah. you just finding a cool trip and sharing it? That's a mm. lot harder to get traffic for, mm. right? If we're taking a look at what people are searching for on YouTube, 10 best travel tips for going to Thailand in April, mm. right? Any of those kinds of things that we know there's already search volume for, there's already people looking for, that's the type of content we need to create. Once we have a ton of traffic, we have an email list, if we want to create a piece of content, that's the things I'm passionate about this week mm. in, you know, relating to travel, we can do that. But the thing with content, whether it's YouTube or blog content, and we should be doing a mix of those if we can, um, is that we need to pay attention to what people actually are looking for and not just do the thing and answer the questions we think that people should be interested in. Mm. Does that make sense? It's a yeah. lot harder for us to get search traffic for things we think people should be interested in mm -hmm. rather than looking at what we know people are interested in and creating that first. Mm. Yeah, no, and um, she says, yes, on my website and Pinterest. Um, okay. That that's good. Now, the one thing I would do here, and this is a little, a little, uh, tactical, I guess, um, is where I would take your website domain. I would go into Uber suggest, and I would see if there is any keywords that are within striking distance. Like a lot of times we don't look at that. We just look at like, well, we're not getting any traffic. How do you really know how close you are from getting the traffic, right? Because you might have some, some blog content that you've written that is on page two, but with a little bit of love, you can get it to page one. Or maybe it's on the bottom of page one, and with a little bit of love, you can get it up um, higher in the search. Or maybe there's a keyword that you are on page one, um, and it gets 1,600 searches a month, and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize it got that many searches. Maybe I should go ahead and give that a little bit more love, a little bit more attention and optimize it a little bit further. Um, so a lot of times there's some low hanging fruit there. Um, and that's actually what we just recently did. We did that with a few posts on this brand. Um, and uh, and I, I know that she's in Brand Creators Academy too. So she knows the brand that we're talking about. And you know, there's a couple of articles that we've written that were like, holy cow, like those are ranking better than I thought. And I didn't realize it had that much search traffic because we didn't, we didn't concern ourselves with the search traffic in the beginning as much, um, but wow. Those are, those are good. So maybe we should go back and tweak them a little bit. And that's what we did. Add a little bit of content, add some more images, make it a little bit more user-friendly, um, all of those things. Um, so that's what I would suggest there on that. But, um, cause sometimes you just don't know really the potential that's there because you're only looking at like the traffic that's coming there, uh, you know, versus the traffic that could be coming there with just a little bit more work, just a little bit yeah, more. Yeah. And I, I just took a look at, at your YouTube channel. I think it's Karen. It's right? Karen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you are making kind of the mistake that I was just talking about. It It's not necessarily the content. And you may just be able to rework some of your titles and descriptions and get more traffic out of it. Um, but just looking at some of the videos, this is not the things that people are generally going to be searching for. Um, like your most recent one from four days ago. Unless it's, that's a very specific thing, and it's not something that people would necessarily be searching for. Um, there's a couple of these that are like really close, mm. like um, ten items you must have for a carry-on flight. You could probably rework the title and description on that and bring in a lot more search traffic. Um, but then you have things like uh, why do airlines shut the the door ten minutes before departure? There may be some some search for that. But it's not necessarily going to be on YouTube. It's probably going to be on, on Google for that. Mm. Um, and then a lot of this is just things um, like special airline meals. That's, a, that's an OK thing to create a piece of content about. But we need to be conscious of what people are actually searching for related to that. Does that make sense, Scott? Um, yeah. So what are, what are the actual things that people are typing in? Most people probably aren't typing in special airline meals. They're typing in best airline meals for people with celiac disease, mm -hmm. best airline meals. So we have to kind of pay attention to those things and niche down that content. And I think what you're doing, the habit that you're in is great. We just need to tweak that a little bit to make the content fit the search. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And and Karen, I, I again, I know that you're you're in the academy. If you ever want us to do like a hot seat and kind of you know dive into your brand, um, we can do that in front of the class. And uh, and that's what we've done also for others. Um, I think it would be useful. Um, I am. What I did too is I searched um, and I looked through the videos, and I can see that the top video is uh, talking about you know non-revenue travel tips, um, staff travel tips. So. I think anytime you can do tr like like savings or um, how to make that travel easier, that's where I would start to go and start and looking at. The thing that's really interesting, and Karen, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but she's going after two different markets here, and I think either one could work. Mm -hmm. One of them is like airline employee travel tips, yeah. right? Like a non-rev flight, and Karen, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but a non-rev flight is usually for people who are flying like a jump seat, right? So if you, Scott, if we're married, and you're a pilot, I can use your benefits to fly, and that's a right. non-rev seat, right. right? Or we can travel as a family because you're you're an airline employee, and that's considered a non-rev seat. So one thing that might be really cool, and you, Karen, you'd have to dive in and do the niche analysis on this. Everybody that likes travel is writing a travel blog for generic people, right? Or travel blogs for families. I don't know. I'm sure there are a handful of resources that exist, but I have a handful of friends who are pilots or are married to pilots, and they don't know all of the ins and outs. So maybe niching down and being the travel agent, like the the travel guide for airline employee families or like those kinds of things, like the non-rev travel side of stuff, mm. right? If you can fly anywhere for free, how do you then turn that into a family vacation? Or how do you make the most of, you know, being on a jump seat? or whatever, and, and Karen said she's calling that staff travel, and there there were a handful of videos that are on there that are all about that. And I think that could be a really cool angle for you if you know enough about that to start to dive into that, because I, and I'm not in the market, so I'd right. have to dive in and see, but I'm not aware of any resources on that side of the market. I'm aware of 100 different travel blogs for generic yeah. stuff, but the staff well, again, travel that's... side of stuff, the airline employee side of stuff, there's a lot of nitty gritty details there that people may not know, especially if they're new to the market, Right. If I just got hired as a pilot, I'm not going to know all of the uh, nobody ever hired me as a pilot, by the way. Um, <laughs> I suck even at airplane simulators. Um, <laughs> I can fly the crap out of a hot air balloon, though. Um, nice. I, I may not know all of the details of American Airlines staff travel policy. And so the first time I take a trip, I'm going to Google, how do I bring my whole family on a non-rev flight? What are the best things to do at an airport when I'm stuck there? You know, how do I get through security? How do I make sure that everything gets checked in? You're going to have a lot of the same questions, but they're going to be phrased differently. And it's going to target a different side of the market that might actually be way easier to compete in. I don't know. You'd have to look at it, but it's something that that would be really interesting. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I, I just I did go in and just search the the um, in Uber suggest. And there are some keywords that are being ranked. One of them that's being ranked doesn't get a ton of search, but it gets something, um, gets searched 70 times a month. Uh, position, you're at position 82 for golf clubs on airplanes. So it's like, again, that's a question people want to know. Can I take golf clubs on airplanes? You know, that's, or that's a great example of a uh, massively low number on something that's significantly higher. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Like there's no way 72 people a month actually type right. in golf clubs on airplanes. Right. It's, or some variation of that. It's got to be a thousand times that, right? Yeah, no, exactly. Um, and so if we can create that article and, and make that a better piece of content, then there's the potential that we can rank for that. And and Scott, just, just to give people an example of what we're talking about there. So let's just say we have a piece of content. It's a couple hundred words on taking golf clubs on airplanes. Okay, what are the other questions that people ask? Like, how do we, how do we increase the search rank for that article? What are the other things that people ask? So if we answer, can I take golf clubs on airplanes? Yes. And then here's the three things that you need to do. That's not the full article that we're going to create. What are the other related questions that people are asking? Okay, how much does it cost to take golf clubs on airplanes? How safe is it to take golf clubs on airplanes? What's the type of bag? Do I need a hard case to take golf clubs on airplanes, right? We need to bring in some of those related searches to answer inside of that, that same piece of content well, so that we can answer the question completely. Because when people are typing that in, they don't just want the yes or no answer. They want to know all of the details. And that helps us rank not only better for that generic search term, right? Because we're a better resource, but we also then start to rank for all of those other questions. Right. Like, can I, you know, do I need a hard case to bring golf clubs on airplanes? How much does it cost? All of those longer tail search terms. We also rank for all of those, which brings in more traffic, which then helps us rank because Google sees this as a better resource for the name, the, the, the main search term. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, a, a quick way to do this too is like, and, and we, we talk all about this in the Academy, but also on our free, on the free guide or the checklist. Um, if you just go to brandcreators.com, I'll, I'll put the link up after, um, but that'll help you with this. But this is exactly what I'm doing right now. I'm kind of going through that process. So if you're on Google and you just did a search up and let it fill in auto fill, can I take golf clubs on? And the first one that comes up is Amtrak then Southwest airlines, Allegiant air, Qantas, Ryan air, a Virgin flight, Jetstar, right? So, um, if I put in airplane or a, it, it doesn't really even come up. Be- well, here it is. Now it is, um, but it wasn't coming up, but let's just, I'm just going to go ahead and go through that process. So now, okay, that comes up. Can I carry a golf stick on a plane? Right. What is it? So what is I put in, stick? can I take golf clubs on an on airplane? <laughs> it came up and said the the snippet is, can I carry a golf stick on a plane? And then people also asked, can I take golf clubs as hand luggage? How do you transport golf clubs on plane? How much does it cost to bring golf clubs on plane? Do airlines charge extra for golf bags? Uh, so I just literally did that in less than five minutes just from that one search. Well, and, and so going back to how do we make that piece of content better, Scott? Yep. Now that you were able to see that. So let's just say we've answered the question. The, the answer is yes, you can, mm-hmm. right? How much does it cost is another question. And then you have every airline on the planet, what is their policy, right? So you create then either a table or a list. I would probably put it in a table because that's more organized. Um, And it's the airline in alphabetical order, right? So it's the name of the airline, how much it costs, how far in advance you have to check them in, where you pick them up, whether you pick them up on the tarmac or in bulk luggage, or if it comes off on the regular, you know, the regular luggage carousel and maybe three or four other pieces of details. And then we just go to Ryanair's website right. and fill in the table. We then go to Allegiant and fill in the table. We then go to Spirit and American and Virgin and all of the other airlines and just fill in the table with those details and become the ultimate resource for that. Right. And then we start to rank for how do I, you know, how much does it cost to bring golf clubs on Ryanair? Well, because mm-hmm. we have that information in the blog post, right. it's then obvious to Google that we have that mm-hmm. information and it's, it's ranking for related terms. So we're going to show up for that. Potentially we just show up in the snippet or we show up at the top of the search result for every single individual one of those, because we're building kind of the best resource that's, that's out there on the internet to do that. And it's super simple. You just have to think through the process of what is the next thing that people are asking and then how do we answer that in the best way? Yep. All right, cool. This went a little bit longer than I thought, but we got into a little bit of a a little strategy session there. Rabbit hole. Yeah. A little rabbit hole, but it's fun. Um, but yeah, maybe we'll do a whole, um, you know, maybe a little coffee call and we'll, we'll dig into, um, opportunities of finding, you know, low hanging fruit and as far as content goes. And I know Karen had said that she'd love us to do a hot seat in the Academy. So we'll probably be doing that as well. So that'd be a fun one to do, Chris. Um, we've already kind of got a head start on it, but, uh, already just in five minutes of doing a little bit of digging, we've already discovered that. And I also noticed too, uh, Karen, which we can definitely help you with is, um, on YouTube, you're, um, you're not really optimized. Um, so just at a brief, uh, glance, the top video that has 1135 views, which was posted about a year ago, actually yesterday was a year. Um, and it's got 1135 views, 15 likes. Um, you have very few video tags. Um, and the title could probably be better. Um, so yeah, I mean, even without, you know, basically knowing a hundred percent of what you can do, uh, you, you, you did okay. Um, but it can be definitely tweaked, but it looks like the description could be beefed up a little bit. There's no cards in it. There's no end cards. Um, all of that stuff helps. Um, again, I'm not a, a YouTube expert. I'm still learning it myself, but I'm always testing and trying new things. Um, but, um, it's, it seems like you already are pretty familiar with like the actual, you know, uploading process. So that's good. And then now we just have to optimize that and then leverage that over on our blog and website stuff. So, um, all right, Chris, let's wrap this up. That went a little bit longer today, but, uh, Hey, why not? Um, so guys, if you could do me a favor, um, if you're on YouTube, leave a comment or, you know, give us a little love there on YouTube. If you're on Facebook, same thing. Give us a little love there. Um, like it, share it, um, comment. If you have any questions, if you're watching this on a replay, let us know that as well. And then, yeah, that free resource. I got two free resources for you. Brandcreators.com. 
If you go there, you'll be able to get our um, our little checklist. It's a brand growth validation checklist, which will help you. It'll actually go through that process that we just went through, but more visually. Um, and you can do that. And then the other thing is, if you haven't started building a list yet, listbuildclass.com. If you go there, listbuildclass.com, you'll get our free list building training there. Um, totally free. So both of those. So you have list build class, and then you have brandcreators.com. And both of them will give you some free resources. So um, Chris, got anything you want to wrap up with? Or are we good? I'm, I'm good to go. Other than guys, figure out what that thing is that you're going to use all this extra time for and double, triple down on it. Yeah. And please don't say Netflix. Yes, <laughs> please do not say Netflix. Uh, all right, guys, that's it. That's going to wrap it up. This was fun. Have an awesome, amazing day. Stay positive and stay taking action because, uh, hey, without taking action, we don't get results, right? One step at a time, one little move at a time. All right, so that's it. It's going to wrap it up. As always, take care, take action. I'll talk to you soon.